Welcome to RPG Reanimators, a podcast for GMs where we dissect horror scenarios and offer our experience and advice to reanimate it at the table. I'm Lex. I'm Alex. I'm Nathan. And we have a special guest this evening. Hey, I'm Holly Buto. Let's see what's on the slab. The case report for this session is Uncle Timothy's Will, which is a scenario written by Keith Herber for Call of Cthulhu. In this scenario, the greedy extended family, aka the players, of the deceased Uncle Timothy gather for the reading of his last will and testament. The will has one stipulation. Anyone who wishes to inherit their portion of the wealth must remain on his estate for the rest of the weekend. As with any dissection, We'll be discussing all the gross innards of the scenario, so from this point on, there will be spoilers. So if you're interested in playing the scenario, please stop here and share this episode with your GM so they can listen and consider running this for your group. We'll also include links for where you can purchase a copy of this scenario for yourself in the show notes of this episode. Now with that out of the way, let's begin our dissection. So. What's the general setup of this scenario? That doesn't make sense to ask after I literally just explained the setup of this scenario. (laughs) How about what's really going on? Yeah, so what's really going on is that Timothy Duncan is a sorcerer who's managed to find the key to immortality. And to do that, he needs lots of hearts. Um, And it just so happens that the number of hearts corresponds perfectly to the number of uh, nieces and nephews that he has in his family. So he fakes his own death and invites all of, well, his will invites all of his uh, nieces and nephews to his home for the reading of his will. And as Lex said, the reading of the will is... Uh, The stipulation is they must stay over the course of the weekend in order to gain their inheritance. Um, I have made an important sticking point to all the characters is that they desperately need money. They may not all realize that about each other. And in fact, some of them very successfully hide behind a facade of wealth. But it's very crucial that you make sure that all of your players desperately need this money otherwise when shit gets real they're gonna run this is almost like the perfect storm because you have these desperate pcs you have an opportunity for them to to change their lives with uh uncle timothy's wealth million dollars yeah and uncle timothy who's currently a fat boiling in a pot of soup he doesn't plan for the relatives to to live the entire weekend. He's going to try and kill them all. Exactly. And so going back to how inter- how to introduce the characters, um, something that I thought was really important as well is to give them all secrets. The scenario as it's written has open knowledge among the family. You know, it's it's your family. Everyone knows each other's business. But I thought it would be better to enhance the tensions of everything to give everyone secrets. How did you decide who got whose secret? Um, I tried to go somewhat a little bit with what would cause the most drama. And I think at the end of the day, it it probably was a little bit of just randomization. Um. You know, tried not to give two people each other's secrets and spread mm-hmm. out the wealth a little bit. But um, yeah, I don't think there was a, a ton of thought put into who got what secret. Yes, I love the, the video you did on Into the Darkness's channel for your run of Uncle Timothy's Will. It was very exciting seeing all of the player characters have these hidden agendas and they were very quippy and snarky. And that really enhanced the game. Yeah, just giving giving each of the and to Keith Herber's credit, he did write kind of funny and interesting characters, kind of caricature ish, which is fun to lean into when you're doing like big role playing. Is all of these tropes are present? You have 
the lawyer that owes money to the mob, the doctor who's running out on his family with his mistress. So it's all these kind of goofy and silly characters and leaning into that and giving them a lot of ridiculous details. The college student who's a poet and thinks he knows everything and is a, a socialist. It's it's all just, yeah, giving big personalities to your players allows them to really lean into it a lot. Who's your favorite PC? Oh. <laughs> the one, truly the one that no one ever chooses. And that's Elizabeth Duncan. I've run this mm-hmm. scenario at least half a dozen times. And I think she's only been chosen once, but I've written her I added this a little bit. I, they were, the way she's originally written, she's just kind of bitchy, you know, snobby and bitchy and spoiled. And she's burned through a couple of inheritances already. Uh, I made her a black widow. And so she's like killed a couple of her husbands. She's burned through their wealth. She's working on some more. And that was her secret that one of her cousins knew. Actually, it made the most sense for the doctor to know her secret that she'd killed her husband or the lawyer. It, one of them, actually. But um, no one ever chooses her. I don't know why. <laughs> Now let's go over some of these other PCs that are available. So I know you've already glossed over some of them, but just working from the top, we've got Harvey, Duncan Allen, an ambulance chaser, which is actually a a nickname for a lawyer that looks out for uh, accidents to happen so they can start representing the person. And they are bankrupt, right? They need the money. Which is a common thread for all these PCs. They're bankrupt. Yeah, it was money to the mob, actually. Yes. Yeah, the mob made bad investment, yeah. bad investment decisions. It's burying the lead to say he's broke. He's broke to the mob. <laughs> yeah. He's probably, I would guess, the most desperate of all of them because he has mm. a literal gun pointed at his head in, you know, in his real life. Right. And speaking of guns, he brings his rifle. Yes, Harvey's also a big game hunter. Moving right along to Sydney Duncan, the physician. This is the one with the mistress, Mindy. Yep, Sydney is probably the one, as written especially, that has the least need for money because he's a doctor. Um, so when I tuned up his character, I made it so that he had suffered a few malpractice uh, suits recently. And so he Ooh. actually truly did need money. Um, but yeah, that's his secret. He's got a mistress who's who is also waiting for him in town and a, a handy a handy NPC to have should you need her. Right. And then we have Jack Duncan, the the radical political student type. Yeah, I believe the He's... technical term is nitwit on the character sheet. Oh, yes. <laughs> it is indeed nitwit. Radical political nitwit. Uh, who is prone to uh, his own version of Vogon poetry, I suppose, because no one seems to like it very much at all. Um, And I had given him that he didn't have a particular secret either. So I said he'd failed out of college and no one knew that. And he was, yeah, Yeah. he was still milking his parents for money and saying he was going to class. So, yeah. It was uh, very entertaining watching David Gassaway portray (laughs) Jack Duncan in the Into the Darkness video. Yeah, David's great. Then we have Fiona, an entertainer. Yes. um, Something uh, in, you know, if you if you know a little bit about your history, Fiona is a dancer, which is uh, women of of means didn't do that in the 20s as a reputable thing. It was kind of akin to almost sex work. Uh, Salacious. Scandalous. Yeah, it's very salacious. And um, she had a, an abortion she's you know she lives a wild life in paris and parties all over europe and yes she's had an abortion which is quite scandalous and last but not least we've got lord jeffrey duncan i believe from scotland yes it, he's kind of the standout as to it makes you wonder why this this particular character was written for this scenario someone who lives all the way in in, in scotland and that's never really dug into but that's okay too it was fun well, he's got a sword cane he does have a sword cane, which does bring a, a fun element to it. Um, and he, yeah, he's flat broke and is in danger of losing the Duncan estate. And much of the scenario was really designed to take these PCs together into sort of a perfect storm. Uh, but for that reason, there isn't a whole lot else in there. I think we tallied it up and it's maybe 10 pages, including one large picture in it. There are some details for the house and a couple of NPCs. But besides that, it just sort of gives a scale of events for how things are going to progress for the evening. 
There's some areas for the house that are detailed in the text. Uh, if y'all don't mind, just like to go over some of those here. Um, for the house proper, there's a small map that gives the different rooms as well as an outdoor area. Which one do you want to go over first? Indoor. All right, so let's just do the first floor then. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> well, looking at the first floor, there's things like the living quarters for a couple of the people. There's a library where they might get some background information about why exactly things are happening and a, a pretty basic servants quarters and then a dining room. For the most part, I think most of the action is going to be taken up in the uh, the executor's room once he has his heart ripped out. I wouldn't write it off yet because there's a lot of makeshift improvised weaponry that you can find around the house, including an old, dusty 12-gauge shotgun, <laughs> which, if it isn't cleaned properly, just blows up in your arm. There's a lot of chances in this for investigators to off themselves. <laughs> uh, on the second floor, you have a couple more rooms for player characters, a good vantage point for those that need to notice things outside at night happening. There's also a locked master bedroom and study that, again, can be used to bring in Uncle Timothy's master plan. Right, and I'd like to mention all throughout the house, there are secret passageways that people can use to enter private rooms. In fact, that's one of the ways that the servants uh, who are possessed by Uncle Timothy can uh, rip out the lawyer's heart. And what's nice is none of these are really detailed on the map that's included in the scenario, so you can really feel free to drag and drop in these entrances whenever you want. There's the basement, workshop, and cellar entrance in there. And additionally, there is not a map, but there is also a graveyard and more of a standalone sill outside that can have some special treats for investigators that go out that far. And we shouldn't gloss over the fact that the basement also has the money. The entire MacGuffin, the money's in the basement. And Holly, did you add the secret passages? I don't recall reading that in the scenario. I did, actually. The, the secret passages... Uh, I, I'm going to be honest. I think the least, my least favorite part of the scenario is the map, which is dreadful. It is not uh, really indicative of a mansion at all. Uh, a two-story building with like a handful of like little rooms doesn't really evoke the idea of some grand family estate. And the descriptions leave a lot to be desired. Um, so yes, I did. And truly on the fly add the hidden walls in which one could travel around the home unseen wow i can't believe i missed that yeah even in the first description that it's saying that yes there's the dead executor with his chest ripped open and footprints that lead to the back door i i guess i just have internalized your run of it because i imagine reading <laughs> like they go into the wall and that's what really keys it in but your run was just so good holly <laughs> oh thank you that's very kind uh, yeah, and, and the descriptions in, in the rooms, um, and I'm not sure if you guys want to get into this right now, um, they they all leave a little bit to be desired. There's not a ton to find, you know, your traditional mm -hmm. typical Call of Cthulhu investigators are going to dig deep. And as the scenario is written, it, they're not going to get a lot of stuff. So be ready to... Think on your feet or at least plan some some items for them to find to really further the story or even just drop some like um, there's a chess set in the master bedroom. Every time, every single time I've run this, they want to know what's going on on the chessboard. The first time I had nothing to give them. Everything after that, I had to look it up because I'm not a chess player. I said that it was in the middle of. Uh, it was in the middle of a game, and if they pressed on what was going on in the game, I told them it was in the middle of a Dutch gambit, which, if you know anything about chess, is a move in which you sacrifice pawns in order to win the game. Like, it is an aggressively sacrificial gambit in which you sacrifice as many pieces as possible in order to win the game as quickly as you can. I like um, that. It's on the nose. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It is very on the nose. And you know what? No one's ever, they're like, oh, okay. 
<laughs> no one's ever like dug into that a little bit, but so that was just for me, a little treat for me. <laughs> <laughs> so who else are lurking around the estates? Well, I don't know about lurking, but Dr. Charles Turner is the attorney that executes the will. So he kind of has a, a very brief role as uh, explainer of the will and then corpse to be examined. Uh, there is Jameson, the butler, crusty old butler, stereotype sort of fellow, barely hanging on to sanity by a thread, although it's a fair bit higher than I expected. When they said low sanity, I saw 25 and thought, well, that's you got a quarter. You're doing fine. Right. And it's in, it's implied that their like entire will is broken and they just mm -hmm. serve Uncle Timothy. Although it's not immediately obvious they you have to prompt for a psychology role, it says. So they must have something left over. And kind of in that same vein is Henrietta the maid, uh, also known as the initial murderer of Dr. Charles Turner. Did you do anything special with the NPCs for this one, Holly? Um. You know, the NPCs are, uh, I, I always love a long suffering British butler. So <laughs> just kind of affecting that personality is always fun. Uh, Henrietta, I, the, the way I presented it to the players was that Jameson was this like figure that had been in their lives forever. Just this ancient guy who never seems to like age at <laughs> all. And has always been with uncle Timothy, but Henrietta was someone not overly familiar to them and they they get a glimpse of her maybe once and then she becomes very noticeably absent but i wanted that it was like mm -hmm. where's the maid why hasn't the maid she's not serving you drinks she's not serving you dinner where the, where the heck is the maid which foreshadows the fact that someone hopefully will see her wandering around the grounds later on in the night and at what point do you tend to turn these NPCs into threats for the characters? It sort of alludes to it in the text itself, but when do you tend to flip that switch? I like to have a moment of time where the PCs genuinely think one of the cousins who couldn't make it is hunting and killing people. Mm -hmm. I would like that big question mark of what is happening here? Because I like having one cousin who who didn't couldn't make it for whatever reason. That we'll get to that later. And then the idea becomes: is this is this the cousin doing all of this? And then they read Uncle Timothy's diary in which he is stated: Jameson and Henrietta are under his control, and they have their orders, and everything is ready. Which is like a really great cliffhanger midpoint if you want to split this up into um, more than one session is to leave it there is like oh no the staff so i i prefer i guess that's the question i prefer that the truth of henrietta and jameson not come out until they read uncle timothy's diary and at that point the switch is flipped they become aggressive toward the players as well so Kind of continuing the threats, I, I remember when you ran it, we had some animated dead as well that Uncle Timothy could call up. Uh, they seemed like a uh, a very much an environmental sort of threat in terms yeah, of... Yeah, God bless uh, Keith Herbert. He, he was just throwing everything but the kitchen sink <laughs> at players in this one. But it's fun. It's like it, it, it adds to kind of its almost pulpiness a little bit. Um, at the end, he raises the, the dead um, and they can get a little taste of you know there there's a cemetery they can wander the cemetery if they choose and that later comes back to bite them that uncle timothy will raise the entire duncan family in order to prevent them from leaving the estate and getting away they're not particularly strong or particularly mm -hmm. effective they're just skeletons mostly but uh it is it's a, it's a fun you know, but they're fun. also your relatives they're also your relatives. <laughs> and if anyone dies a little prematurely, I like to have them also be reanimated. Mm -hmm. And then there's a the choice of, you know, would you just like to play the reanimated dead going after your cousins, which did happen in my run of Into the Darkness with <laughs> um, Simon. Yeah, he ended up attacking one of his cousins after he had died. So... <laughs> 
I think it's funny that you mentioned everything in the kitchen sink about the zombies in the backyard, because that one at least was kind of contiguous, like, okay, you got dead people. There's also just a demon yeah. that always seems to come severely out of left field for me. Yes. Um, it's just, oh, you're searching around the house and there's an idol and there's a demon and you're getting carried away. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs> that That seems to me like... If the money isn't working as the carrot, the demon is the stick. Hmm. If the players just try to leave. That's how I've always used him. And it's not, it's not a great, you know, I, I will admit it's not particularly stellar writing to right. just it's say, a product well, if you're going to leave, I'm going to force you to stay. Uh, and there's a couple of things on the topic of like, eventually your players are just going to want to leave. This is, this is terrifying. My life is in danger. So you know, you have the servants slash their tires so they can't leave via car. They try to leave via car, but now they're having to make drive rolls as they're trying to go drive down a mountainside with a sheer cliff face that they have no guardrail for. Or you have a demon. This they, scenario is 30 years old. Oh, wow. It is. Over 30 years old. And it I is. think as written, isn't it kind of terrible weather? So even if oh, the yeah. tires weren't slashed, they'd there was a pretty good chance they just careen off a cliff and need a backup character. But going back to Lex's comment, and it's, it's a fair comment that this is kind of out of left field for anyone who wants to improve on the scenario, having more hints that really suggest mm -hmm. Uncle Timothy's, you know, journey into witchcraft and demonry. And like, that would be a good way to buff up the scenario with more things more things your players might find throughout the house so i do have a question or just sort of a thought off the cuff about that is in reading this i always imagine timothy is sort of seeped into the manor itself like bringing up the dead in the house and in the grounds if the players want to leave like that i would be much more tempted to essentially have timmy evil dead them with trees and have the roots start climbing up out of the mm -hmm. ground to snare them if they start trying to escape and then drag them back. I mean, it doesn't make as much sense to have zombies crawling up out of the ground everywhere like rabbits. So that was the other idea. I think that's actually a really excellent idea. Yeah, yeah that's good. I like it. And that's good. They do kind of mention that Uncle Timothy, if you really get desperate and the demon doesn't work somehow... Uncle Timothy can also show up and will try and kiss people while they sleep which I'm not quite sure why the investigators are sleeping in the house after being attacked by a <laughs> demon, but to each their own. Knockout really, gas. This, is, this one is truly an, exer an exercise in pacing. Uh, you really mm -hmm. have to pace how much danger your PCs feel before hitting that tipping point where you know they're all going to start trying to flee, and then you start throwing everything but the kitchen sink at them. So in regards to pacing, the scenario itself is broken into several steps from like step one to step four. Yep. What key events would you really use to punctuate each of those steps or to really try and lend a hand to pacing for your players? I think stage one is pure role playing. Let them snipe at each other. Let them be assholes to each other. Something that I, I I cannot take credit for this. This came from how we roll, but the idea of one cousin trying to prevent all the others from making it to the house mm -hmm. so that they can inherit everything sets a great tone of animosity from the very beginning because they're already entering the scenario like, well, fuck you. You <laughs> didn't even want me to be here. So stage one is just sniping at each other and role play. Uh, stage two is the exploration of the house where they get a feel for who Timothy Duncan was and the, the history of their family, which there is some history of weird witchcraft in their family. And so like that's that's our punctuation marks. There is a hint that not everything is just a white bread cookie cutter American family. This weirdness kind of pervades the family history. And then stage three is what's going on you can see someone sees someone moving around the grounds in the night is that one of the servants is that the cousin that didn't make it to the reading of the will what's going on what are they doing here and then around stage four is when they should start feeling the heat of danger they wake up and the lawyer's dead 
and he has no heart. It's not just, oh, he had a heart attack or a stroke. He is missing a heart. <laughs> That's when you're going to start getting some PCs that are like, why am I here? Well, like, let's let's get out of here. Let's let's leave. Um, and so that's when you start, that's when you start pressing. Um, so that's, it's, it's tricky because b- before that you do want them to get a feel for the grounds, the cemetery, the mausoleum, the elements that are going to be highlighted a bit later on. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's pacing can be a little tricky in this one. So one of the things there that I think is kind of interesting, the brew house is a pretty key location, but it's it they don't really learn about it unless they're wandering the grounds or they find, I think it's a triple hidden French record oh God, from yeah. Richard Duncan about how there's a brew house out there. Uh, how do you... Yeah, you, that, that how, do, yeah how do you get that introduced maybe a little more naturally such that players can find it before they stumble at the end? Yeah. Throw, first of all, the, the thing written in French is completely absurd because as it's written, none of the PCs speak French, which is hilarious because one of them <laughs> lives in Paris. Um, so <laughs> yeah. I would say either make it so that it's written in English or at least give give the guy who lives in London and the woman who lives in France some French so that some of them can read it, <laughs> which also adds a little bit more than it's like you have this hidden information of only some people know this. Um, and how many track rolls does the scenario demand they pass in order to find the brew house? It's, it's silly. Uh, no, don't do that. (laughs) I I think (laughs) most of the people, when they see someone wandering around in the backyard, um, and then you can kind of hit like, it seems like they're moving off to the edge of the property and you kind of lose sight of them from there. They're, they're mucking around in the graveyard, the mausoleum, then they move out towards the side. And that gives them the hint that like something's out there beyond the property line. And if they proceed to try and pull on that thread, you know, muddy footprints, if it it was raining, terrible weather. So they can find like muddy footprints that lead into the woods. And at that point, maybe a search, maybe not necessarily track, but because like who has track? No one has track except for the the big game hunter. Um, Spot hidden. Sorry, my Delta green's coming through. I said search. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Spot hidden to just, follow the tracks there yeah because the, as it's written it's it is a incredibly fun scenario i don't want to downplay that at all just it does need a few like rule tweaks to it that it's just like uh no let's make this better so what would you really say then is the beating heart of this scenario uh i think this scenario truly thrives on the role playing and the strongly uh, motivated pcs like it's if any other scenario like any other relationship uh, just a group of investigators a bunch of friends like it wouldn't nearly be as fun as it is i think in my opinion um you know i i've i've said before there's like three constants in life death taxes and family drama everyone understands family (laughs) drama it's so timeless you know you can set this in the 20s and it works you could set it in modern day and it still works because everyone understands family drama i wholeheartedly agree just have to multiply the money yeah yeah like this is such a player driven scenario yeah i think some of the most fun that i had playing this was actually in the initial parts where we were just scouring the house looking for money and making little alliances between different players and kind of backstabbing each other just so much fun and it was always really fun to be like well maybe we should Check out the garage. Maybe his car's worth something. You maybe you can really manipulate it a little bit to have players want to investigate because there might be some good stuff that Uncle Timmy left behind. It definitely helps that none of the PCs are entirely likable. <laughs> you know, they're all horrible. <laughs> but and I like that they're written that way. They, they, there's there's fun in, in just being like a bad person, like a shitty person that. <laughs> only cares about themselves and hates the people they're all related to. I, I tell every time I run this game, I tell people, go watch Knives Out. It's a good motivation. Like it'll it'll get you in the right mindset of just snarky asshole family that no one like you can't stand each other. You hate each other's guts. And when we're all done with this, I hope I never see any of you ever again. 
Um, so yeah, <laughs> that is definitely um, the fun. And, and it's fun from a keeper perspective. Every time you play it is different. I have had people out the gate start trying to kill each other. Like one time I ran it and someone as Harvey was try- immediately trying to poison people. I'm going to serve them some food that I have poisoned with rat Holy poison. And crap. of course, no one trusted him. <laughs> so no one ate the food that he was offering. But And that's part of the fun too, is none of them are particularly good at combat. Even the hunter, which I guess probably speaks to how competent a hunter he actually is. Um, none of them are very good at combat, but that makes it fun. Like they can try and they will probably fail to kill each other but then it's the drama of it and the role play of it just makes it funny but there's always the the secretary that sydney is having an affair with in town should you need to bring in an npc for someone who dies a little too early (laughs) what were you saying nathan (laughs) Uh, that was exactly my question of uh mindy in town is kind of a backup do you ever use the cousin that went ahead is she kind of in the list of spares oh the one that no one okay, yeah so the one that no one it. chose so it could be any of them yeah. but i think ah, it was, so the one that no uh, one chose is actually fun because she or he or whoever the, the one that no one chooses goes up ahead of all of them because they're all greedy assholes and uncle timothy kills them first but you really lean into that in the reading of the will because obviously your players are from a little bit of a metagaming perspective. They're like, oh yeah, no one chose Elizabeth Duncan. Of course, she's not going to be here. But then you mention it more than once. Elizabeth's not here. And that's weird. So that plants the seed of like, there should be another person here and there's not. And then when they start seeing someone's wandering around the grounds, is that Elizabeth? If they open up the, the barn or the garage, whatever it is now. I think it's a garage repurposed from a horse barn. They'll find the, the missing cousin's car. So then that affirms, oh, they're here. And you you kind of keep giving those clues. They're somewhere. Maybe, maybe they're responsible for all of this. A piece of jewelry, a watch, something like that mm-hmm. that they find. Go ahead, Alex. You could even treat this relative as like Schrodinger's relative, where mm. depending how far you are along this scenario, you can either have them just show up or or be dead. That's true. Absolutely. Yeah. They'd use it however you need it. But I originally had tweaked it as the first sacrifice, which then becomes like a horror point later. Like, oh my God, it's it's so and so. We just thought they didn't show up or or whatever. But that's a that's a good point. They could just be an NPC. Or a PC later if someone dies a little <laughs> a little too early. <laughs> Although I do like the idea. I've never actually had to use her. I do like the idea of the kind of, you know, ditzy young secretary who finally gets tired of waiting for Sydney to come and whisk her away and shows up to a house that has gone completely to hell. It's like, here you go. You get to you get to play this. <laughs> you get to now. be the Donald Glover gif with the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's walking in and everything's on fire. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So I think we've already sort of been towing that line, but let's just formally get into reanimating this scenario. In terms of highlighting the beating heart of this player conflict and really trying to motivate this role play, what other devices do you do to try and help players along to really get the most of it? Holly, you've already mentioned that you gave each of them sort of secrets on each other. Are there any other devices or tricks that you've used to fan the flames? Oh, great question. Um, typically, I don't have to. If you have strong role players, they will just immediately jump into that. But going into what I said initially and a trick that I borrowed from How We Roll, and it's worked beautifully every time, is I have one person arrive early and pay off the local police to try to stop everyone from making it to the house so that they inherit all of the money. And in my write-up to each of the players, I emphasize, if you are not there on time, you will not be given an inheritance. Like, you need to be there at 8 p.m. sharp. So giving that person that background knowledge of, you hired someone to stop everyone else from getting up there. And there, so they're at the house. And they, you know, that's that's a whole fun aspect. And then everyone else is stopped going up the mountain by this police officer who's trying to tell them, the road's closed, you can't get up there. And then eventually when they press on him, because, you know, you you never want that to be the, the barrier for them. Eventually they're going to get through. 
the police officer mutters something that hints to the PC, like, oh, that crazy British guy, I don't know what he's about, or like <laughs> that young broad, like it's not worth it, it's not worth the money. So then it hints like, oh, they were paid, this person was paid them. So that already starts with deep animosity, like you didn't want us to even be here. And that usually immediately starts them into the role playing. Getting into that, just as a thought, would you ever message your players ahead of time after they've selected their characters and say, okay, this is who you're going to be. Is there anything that you would want to do to stop others from getting to the house first and sort of let them load your gun uh, to start the session off and essentially have them lay their own trip mines? I love that. That's an excellent idea, Lex. I've never done that. I've always just provided that roadblock initially, but it's a really great idea, especially if you have people who've done this for a long time they're great role players like giving them giving them that choice is great it's a great way to do it i love the idea there of their plans conflicting with each other as well because you're probably going to have some overlap kind of to that same effect where you might have two police officers both show up on the side of the mountain and be telling or people, they both well, you pay can't off come the through. same police yeah. officer <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh, you can go uh. <laughs> There's just so much opportunity for humor here. Mm. And I think that's one of the charms of it being in the Blood Brothers scenario pack. Yeah, the Blood Brothers build itself as very leaning into the horror tropes, non-mythos and schlocky and pulpy. We're going to do vampires, zombies, demons, witches, and they all read like that very fun and high energy so yeah I, I definitely recommend it if you're looking for something like that i really liked that uncle timothy you mentioned non-mythos it's great that they introduced this essential fats instead of like essential salts kind of a different way to bring it where you can find his clean bones but there's just that tea kettle boiling away that has him in it it's very evocative it's gross <laughs> <laughs> it is it's very gross <laughs> i love uh the image that they put for that that has uncle timothy <laughs> leaping out of the pot going for a kiss yes it's nasty <laughs> besides fanning the flames for player conflicts then uh we mentioned this with the secret hallways before that i just sort of subconsciously internalized what other changes have you made to the grounds and general navigation areas or changes to the clues i I love the idea that they get an essential clue that's in French and no one speaks French for it, but even just giving them a little bit that if they fail that role, I would have two different cues set up. It's like, oh, they might get the actual note or they get their fast awkward translation of it that gives them just wrong enough information to maybe have them wander into the woods into another trap. I actually really love that, Lex. That's brilliant. That's a lot of fun. Um, yeah, more the the demon idol this hinting of more going on with uncle timothy and the leanings toward the this and there's this interesting family history that's like your characters have to care enough to go digging through the library to get right so i tried to drop some hints here and there like they wander into the library and there's that old blood stain that no one's ever been able to scrub mm -hmm. out at this point it's just it's just a part of the home and it's allegedly where this person died. And if they kind of press on it, if they say, Oh yeah, what's, what's that story? Then it kind of comes out the story of Richard Duncan, who'd murdered one of the horse tenders and was eventually tried and killed as a witch by the town. Like that's, that's a really interesting story that just kind of gets glossed over in the scenario and so like really highlighting that and and hinting that there's some weird family history here um is is good i've i the yeah the hidden passages in the home um i think in one scenario i connected the cellar to the mausoleum via like an underground mm -hmm. tunnel because players were pressing on that is something that they thought would be there and i was like sure That's i'll give cool. it to them why not <laughs> yeah, so they come up in the mausoleum and the mausoleum is all like grimy and, and gross where they can find the picked clean body of uh, Timothy Duncan. And I believe in ours, that's where you put the body of the cousin, right? Yeah. Was hiding yep. in the mausoleum as well. The, yeah, Timothy's there. 
And that's their initial hint that something's wrong because his body is way too clean. The cousin's there and then the body of the the witch. And I think I moved that around to the, the distant ancestor who was tried as a witch. His diary is in his tomb, mm-hmm. which they almost like... I, I can count on I can count on two fingers how many times players have actually <laughs> opened up that uh, sarcophagus. Putting that somewhere else is a better idea. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, and sorry, I was thinking about it some more. Um, in the garage, in the stables, because players are inevitably going to want to get into there. Locking it already should tip them that something's going on. Once they get in there, mm-hmm. you could put good weapons because again, like these people, mm-hmm. there's not a lot of. Weapons. So, you know, the pitchforks and things, which actually, you know, could do a fair bit of damage. And that cousin that didn't make it, their car is here, which should also tip them off as to something's going on here. They don't have the full picture of. I think you'd left their purse there as well, which was very unsettling for us, where it's like, why would they leave this behind Mm -hmm. in the car? Yes. Have there been any changes that you've tried and implemented with this that didn't work? You mentioned that you ran it first as written, and it sort of was a bit of a flat soda. And so just in your experimentation with this, because you said you've run this like, what, a half dozen times or more? Yeah, way many, way too many times. <laughs> <laughs> um, a perfectly yeah, sane I tried... number of times. <laughs> um, yeah, the first time I ran it, they, we we still had fun. There, there just wasn't that like hidden secrets. It was all, all dirty laundry out in the open. So they still had that role playing used against them, but it was more just a banter thing. When you start giving people secrets and say, this is blackmail material. That's when the role play gets really interesting. It's like, what are you going to do? How are you going to twist, twist the screw on the people that you really don't like anyway? Um, but to the things that I've tried and didn't quite work. Um, Let's see. I think that I've tried, I've tweaked the ages. The way it's Mm -hmm. written, there's a 20 year difference between the youngest cousin and the oldest cousin, which always struck me as strange, but ultimately it kind of doesn't matter. I don't know. I I have cousins that are that much older than I am. And I don't know. We still have, you, you still have, you can have that relationship with people that's like, I hate you. You just don't grow up with them necessarily, but that still works. Um, Hmm. I mean, I think we've gone over a lot of the things that you've changed that did work. Right. No, absolutely. Yeah. If there's nothing else there, are there any changes that you would like to implement in the future? I think I would like to have a better handle on Timothy himself. It seems to me when I run it, by the time the players get to Timothy, he's just this He's just like this boiling puddle of soup. He's Timmy soup (laughs) in a cauldron. And his only real attack is to like touch them and burn them. And I, that seems a little like, eh, okay. I I mean, I get it. He raises the dead and he sends out the demon. But once you find Timothy himself, it's almost um, anticlimactic. He's just Timmy soup and he'll try to burn you. And that's about it. One thing that Um, I really appreciated that you did was when you reanimated the relatives, you'd actually have Timmy speak out of their mouths. So he could have some banter. He could get some banter in. He could relay some of his motivations. And it's just it's just a great pulpy, schlocky scene. Mm-hmm. And if you wanted to have the players actually narrate some memories they have of visiting Uncle Timothy when they were a kid, that might be a way to bring him in a little earlier. And maybe he can be that creepy old uncle because later on he's like, oh, give your uncle a kiss. I would do that at every flashback, (laughs) every single one. I think that, um, yeah, that's no, that's that's excellent. I love it so much. Um, The the thing you mentioned too, Alex, um, if players get too friendly, what I have done is. Like have Timothy start whispering in their ear, like just, just, just bring me, just bring me someone, just bring me someone, and you'll get it all. You'll get all the money. Try to play to to their greed because 
it either goes one of two ways I've found. It's either every man for himself or we're all going to band together and solve this mystery, which is just a little too feel good for me. Like, no, you all hate each other. We're going to keep pressing on that. <laughs> so then you have Timothy start whispering in their ear about things, like making them promises. Bring the others to me and you'll have it all. I'll but to changes Exactly. Exactly. Um, to more changes. Yeah, I... I Try to think better of the interaction with Uncle Timothy. I I like the idea of him being more of a menace than he is in his liquid form. I'd also like to add more clues throughout the house hinting to the the demons and the family history. It's always been kind of just alluded to in the games I've run. And a better map, which is such like the one of the biggest sticking points of this game to me is it's a terrible map. And I've heard the suggestion use the clue board, which actually isn't a terrible yeah. one. Just like use the the clue map of the the board game. That's fun because that's better. It's better than the one that you have <laughs> provided. <laughs> so how how long do you usually run this as as a scenario? Um, I usually run this. As a single single one shot, because, you know, you, you just keeps the energy high. You can press mm -hmm. it to the end and it takes three to four hours. When I ran it for ITD, it, there was just a great stopping point of them realizing reading Uncle Timothy's diary and, and understanding his machinations and the fact that the the servants are in on the whole thing. And that was a great cliffhanger. So we ended it there. But I think it still ended up being four hours two in one episode to another. So a good a good convention scenario. Hmm. um for sure just yeah about four hour long yeah i would agree it's taken me four hours when i ran this myself well uh alex since you've run it what kind of changes did you make i mostly based my changes off the itd video adding in the secrets i made it a little pulpier so if we're going into war stories territory I'm shocked <laughs> i i added a full plate knight armor set on like a stand mm. complete with like a zly hander two-handed sword <laughs> and one of my players who has gone indefinitely insane one of my player characters who's gone indefinitely insane put that on and then went like toe-to-toe -to -toe with the demon for a couple <laughs> rounds before getting his heart ripped out incredible <laughs> i love that because like you're in a fancy ass house yeah. there's gonna be a suit of plate armor i'm a little surprised you didn't put a skeleton in it no, ah, I mean, or you could have Timothy been... reanimate it, have the suit yeah, of armor exactly. instead of the demon. That at least could. Oh my god, it could have fat in it. That that's yeah, everything just that's oh, oh, seeping out. Oh, oh, that's great. Uh, that's next wonderful. Time. Did you do any down. other pulp edits besides like hamming up the zombies? I allowed for a lot of improv. Mm. I think at at one point someone was using a a car with flat tires to hit zombies. <laughs> mm. <laughs> i love it yeah i love what players will think of one of my favorite aside from the gambit thing which i true i don't know anything about chess i had to go look that up because one group was like what is going on with this chess board and then after that like no one ever bothered to look it up which was like come on um my thing was if they go to the cemetery the tombstones all have the um what, the fuck, what do you call it is it an epitaph is that what's mm -hmm. on the tombstone yeah. is either how they died or their final words. Like that's a Duncan family quirk. Mm -hmm. And so there was like, if they go looking, I'll give them examples. And one of them is a married couple. And Marvin's says died by driving over the side of the cliff on his way up to Duncan mansion. And the wife Martha's says, um, for God's sake, Marvin, slow down. <laughs> <laughs> no! always their last word how they died or their last words Jeez. so uh with the, like the chess set that's very clever signposting mm. that players can pick up later and go oh no the chess set was giving it all away and that's just fun that's fun yep. for everybody god damn it i said it wrong what hmm it, it wasn't the Dutch game. It was the, I knew it was, I was saying it wrong. It was the Danish gambit, which is an aggressive opening in which you play, sa you sacrifice 
your pawns rapidly for spatial advantage. Like the the, the Dutch gambit is also sacrificial, but the Danish one is very aggressive. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, that's I would be okay. Happy I'll, to I'll dub in Danish time. each and every time. <laughs> 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 it's it's going to be Alexa's voice too. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Um, how has that final confrontation with Uncle Timothy usually played out for people? Was there anything you'd like to change there? Because it's, in theory, he's just in a bubbling pot, and I don't remember, I think, Holly, you just let me turn off the pot or turn it on high. And that I think that's what you can do, gas, yeah. And right, I, yeah, you, you that, I think that's pretty much what everyone does. Yeah, everyone is like, I'm not going to open that. I'm just going to, like, turn off the gas or turn on <laughs> yeah. the gas. And at that point, they're close enough. You just have him, like, leap at them from, from the pot, of course. Um, and <laughs> I'm just trying to think of, I've had players... Like try to set the, I, I think the most common thing to do is burn it all down just because mm -hmm. there's a gas line here. Obviously there's a pot boiling. So I'm going to just blow this whole place to kingdom come. And that's, I think that's very typical. So it, pressing in, I guess, advice for future runs, pressing in with like the conga line of the dead on one side, the demon on the other. And really making them feel that pressure more so than I, I I had not done that in the past as much. So that's something I would change. Pressing in more so with all of the and various and sundry dangers, <laughs> seeing what they do with it. <laughs> you know, something that keeps just occurring to me in all of this is I keep imagining Timothy is having a finite amount of will and concentration that it could be interesting that he can only concentrate on bringing up certain, like a certain amount of zombies. And then as mm. they're fighting them, they all drop dead, re dead. And then the demon comes up. Like they get that brief moment of pause and like, why did they all go down? And it's just because he then summoned the demon instead using that bit of concentration. <laughs> I do like that. I do like that. What do, what kind of demon are we talking about here, too? Because I, I don't remember if it's particularly described or if it's uh, just a kind of a generic demon. Uh, it is very, uh, I'm looking at its description right now. It Like, to me, very generically demon, like humanoid-esque, covered in fur, giant wings, wolf-like face, horns. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Nothing to me stands out as unique to this particular demon. As a I thought. I always ran it as gargoyle-esque. Yeah, I was going to say, yes. if you want to have gargoyles on the top of the house, and then just one I of like them is that. gone. Uh, that's great. I like that a lot. It's and you could really even use, it says it mimics speech patterns of anything it hears. That could be fun if you're really paying attention in the initial argument between players. It could actually mimic some of the things they say maybe between themselves in a hallway when they think no one's listening and just start shouting those out randomly while it's oh, attacking. Fun. Yeah, that's that's a really, really great idea, especially if there's like whispered secrets between two cousins and you mm -hmm. whisper it to the, the third about them or something <laughs> like that'd be great. Or especially um, the classic calling for help from oh, behind yeah. the door or something. If you can remember exactly what someone says. What can be fun, too, if you have a player that has died a little prematurely, Ooh. ask them to sort of speak up and ask for help in one of the lines and use that as the lead. Oh, that's excellent. That's devious. a really excellent idea. Very devious. Something else that I have yet to implement, but would love to at some point is just setting this all in modern day. Because as I said, this is the family drama is, is eternal. You know, I, I fight with my cousins just as these people fought with theirs 100 years ago. So I think that really lends itself super well to role playing, too, because you said it in modern. Everyone, everyone is then deeply familiar with the setting and the roles that they can assume and, and playing around with the cousins stereotypes and kind of tweaking them to a modern setting would be hilarious. Right. <laughs> like the college age political nitwit is now an Andrew Tate watching alt right. Yes. Oh, just no. fuck with. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Why don't we just run it in prehistoric times? Yes, it still works. <laughs> Ugh, piece of shit. 
I also oh, like goodness. one of the things they mentioned is that the basement has about $75,000, which is not what they're actually promised in terms of money. It's true. I like the idea that maybe Uncle Timothy really doesn't have that much money. And that can be a fun to where you said before, Holly, of whisper like, hey, bring me a heart. You could even direct players to the basement and say, hey, there's the money. They open it and go 20 bucks. 20 bucks isn't going to buy me anything. You say, well, hey, I also have magic. That's actually you reminded me of a big change I made on that comment. I've never kept the money in the basement because immediately mm. people are just going to leave, <laughs> you know, because they're going to explore the home in the very mm. beginning, right? Before you throw everything at them. And immediately someone's going to go for the basement and say, I'm going to look around the basement. And if they do, because they can still, it, like, they have to pass maybe an extreme spot hidden or a hard spot hidden, but, like, you can still pass it. <laughs> and um, they find all the money, what's keeping them there? Nothing. Like, they're just going to run away with all the money. Right. So either giving them some of the money. I've always put it in the brew house where Timothy is. Mm. And so that's even more doubly painful if they blow up the whole thing. It's like, well, you <laughs> still don't have the money. <laughs> Jeez. I don't know. I'm still such a sucker for like, there's no good ending that mm -hmm. oh, I yeah. I would be very tempted to have the money be a one last sign check by Uncle Timothy. And so they get this check for a million dollars. The one survivor, if any, brings it out and it bounces at the bank. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Incredible. I that that's great. I think if we're talking like war stories one time, I, I ran this and everyone was just <laughs> too nice for their own good like they're like oh we're not you know we're not gonna do anything i think one person ran and just hid in the bushes like i'm not gonna leave because i still want my money but i'm just gonna hide and eventually the cops got called because someone managed to <laughs> i i don't even know how i think one of them ran to the village it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. But anyway, the ending was that the cops came and arrested all of them for murdering their cousin <laughs> and the maid and the and the butler. And they got thrown into a loony bin because who's going to believe them that their deceased <laughs> uncle rose the dead and, you know, attacked all of them. So I think less less of a fun ending, I think. But it was like, hey, if that's the way you guys are going to take it. I'm going to roll with it. <laughs> I'd like to talk about expanding the scenario if we could. Mm -hmm. Sure. One of the things I think is interesting is this is really set up for a one shot. I mean, just from the nature of it. But you could lead off of this if players are successful. They actually have a bit of money, maybe not the million, but a bit of money. They have some interesting occult texts um, that could lead to some adventures. Or if you wanted to, you could really play up the extended Duncan family as weirdos and go into something like Paper Chase or ah. other Call of Cthulhu scenarios where you have some of these cruddy family members just attending various Duncans and discovering that they're all terrible. I like the idea of... If a fake cousin walks away with the books and the money, I like the idea of them becoming a villain in, in, in a future scenario. <laughs> I also wanted to mention the Bedlam Hall role-playing game as an opportunity. If your players like the kind of backstabbing secrets, but as the servants of a household instead of the executors, what do you call will recipients? Inheritors? Like Bedlam Hall is a fun RPG that uh, also relies on that yeah, heavy role-playing secrets. I'm just a big fan of this scenario. Yeah, this was super fun when you ran it for us, too, is just so much backstabbing, so much death and destruction by the end, and I think we might have been hauled away by the police, at least partially. You and were the group that got hauled away by the police. I think <laughs> we're so the too nice group, the Midwest group. I think I even tried to hide so that I would technically inherit everything, but they found me and hauled me away too while I was screaming, don't take me off the grounds, don't take me off the grounds. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's right. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Thank you. 
We hope our deranged utterings are helpful in bringing this game to life at your table. You can join the autopsy discussion on Discord and subscribe or follow the podcast to hear more gruesome cases. Be sure to check out the show notes for links on where to find this scenario, where to find us, and other links for things like handouts or actual plays of the scenario that we recommend or other resources. Thanks again for joining us, Holly. And for everyone else, until next time, thanks for listening to RPG Reanimators. Where your games can die or live on the table. Something that I've always done, if you ever run this in the end, uh, or run this for yourselves, for your players, um, something that I don't know why I do it. I started it with one group that thought it was absolutely fucking hilarious, and then I've just rolled with it ever since, is Uncle Timothy's last words are always to whoever has killed him, you were my least favorite. <laughs> you were my least favorite relative. <laughs> Because that usually ends up being a point of argument among mm-hmm. the cousins at some point is who was the favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and it's always great to just like dash the hopes like, no, you were my least favorite. <laughs> <laughs>